All right, this is OpenStax US History, Chapter 4, Section 4, Great Awakening and Enlightenment. So one of the things in this chapter that is focused on are the long-term causes of the American Revolution. And in fact, we had already started to talk about one of those. And that is, one of them is economic, specifically the Navigation Acts and the way that the British interference with trade really disrupted and angered a lot of the colonists. We're going to look at two other movements that are considered to be long-term causes. Uh, these are both cultural movements. Well, first of all, let's talk about what these, what these movements are. It's the Great Awakening is one and the Enlightenment is two, right? So if we want to say Navigation Acts is one long-term cause, we could say the Great Awakening is number two, the Enlightenment is uh, long-term cause number three. These are both cultural movements. If you're not familiar, culture has a lot to do with things like, you know, belief. Uh, what do you believe about something? What are your attitudes towards it? Those are a good way to, to um, characterize culture. Oftentimes religion is kind of highlighted as being uh, you know, kind of the primary cultural element, but you know, anything that's a belief or an attitude would be considered culture. And both of these movements, the Great Awakening and the Enlightenment, begin in Europe, but make their way to the colonies, uh, and in some ways even, maybe even thrive even more once they come to the uh, colonies. So let's talk about the first one, the Great Awakening. So the Great Awakening is exclusively religious in nature, right? Religious. It is a religious revival, right? Religious revival. And what the Great Awakening seeks to do as a movement is to preach a different type of a different type of religion, and that is rather than it being academic, rather than it being uh, very sort of formal and educated. The Great Awakening is all about emotion, right? So a good way of thinking about the Great Awakening maybe is emotion over uh, logic or something like that. Um, another good way of thinking about it is that religion becomes a matter of the heart, not the mind, right? So you can think of it that way. Religion is something you feel, not think about. And that's what the Great Awakening sought to promote. It's more about personal and experimental faith rather than learned and educated faith. And so this was a new approach to religion that a lot of ministers were taking. And this swept through not just Europe, but also swept through the 13 colonies. Uh, those, divide, or those who were affected by the Great Awakening divided themselves into uh, two categories, new lights and old lights. The new lights, they like the new emotion the new emotional approach, old lights, they liked it, you know, the old way, we'll call them, you know, old school. They said, you know, you should read the Bible, you shouldn't feel it, uh, you should know how to read and, and you know, you need to learn something before you, you preach something. Uh, because preachers had different ways of doing things, it led to uh, new colleges. Some of the first colleges created in the United States were Harvard and Yale. These were religious schools. But the Great Awakening made more colleges. You know, modern day Brown University was in part created by new lights. And again, these new lights were being able to make, uh, make these new colleges. Uh, the two most prominent Great Awakening revivalists were Jonathan Edwards and George Whitefield. Jonathan Edwards from the colonies had his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. That is what you see pictured up here. And this was a sermon that really revealed or showed the emotional side, uh, emotional side, side to uh, to preaching, and uh, Jonathan Edwards used very vivid accounts of hell, right? Very uh, fearful to scare his audience, and uh, a lot of people turned out to hear his sermons. George Whitefield, another one of these ministers or preachers from England, was able to capture massive crowds of people who would go out to these revivalists just to listen to these people preach. This is a newspaper depiction of what a revival might look like. You have your revivalist Whitefield right here in the middle and a whole bunch of other people in the audience listening, dancing, fainting, you know, kind of getting very involved emotionally. A lot different than just like that boring 
everybody be quiet and let the guy read the Bible up there. You know, this was more fun for the time period. Uh, this, uh, this break in religion between new and old led to the rise of certain religious groups, new groups like Methodists, Babs, Baptists, and Presbyterians. Uh, were on the rise. These became much more popular denominations. A lot of the more old school religions that we talked about, so for example, the Puritans or the Congregationalists, uh, the Quakers, the Anglicans or the Church of England, right? These were all on the decline, less and less members that joined or were part of those churches. The most important thing about the Great Awakening was that it helped create a sense of community right? Community in the 13 colonies where you'd meet together with your peers uh, for religious reasons, but you could potentially talk about anything, right? So this was, this movement really sort of created social groups in the colonies, which again are going to be important later on for the revolution. The second of these cultural movements is the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment is much more of a philosophical I don't know if that's spelled right, movement. Or you could think of it as uh, maybe more of like a educated movement, an intellectual movement. Maybe we'll say that, intellectual. And these were new ideas, new ideas about society, new ideas about government. They had their origins in Europe with people like John Locke, who's a very important Enlightenment thinker, maybe the most important Enlightenment thinker. Remember, life, liberty, property, Governments are a social contract. If governments don't secure your rights or protect your rights, you have the right to alter or abolish your government. Very, very important ideas in the Americas. The Enlightenment preached science over superstition. That is, uh, you know, uh, what you know, what you could observe from the world rather than what you believe about it. Reason over faith. The key ideas uh, in the Enlightenment included all these things. We'll just go ahead and explain them very quickly. Uh, rationalism, of course, is the idea that you should use logic. Empiricism is scientific experiment. Progressivism is the idea that humans can use both of these things, right? So you could use logic, rationalism, and thinking. Combine that with scientific experiment, the ability to produce and reproduce uh, what you know about the world. And that could lead to progress, that humans did have control over their own lives. And this was a lot different than what was, you know, what was believed earlier, where, which was, you know, more or less you were at the whim of God's doing. Uh, Enlightenment thinkers said no, that, said no to that. We can learn about the world around us, we can experiment, and we can use that in order to make things better. The last thing, cosmopolitanism. Cosmopolitanism, you could think of it as being like worldly. You know, this is the idea that Enlightenment thinkers ought to think of each other as sort of fellow men rather than set up sort of provincial or, uh, you know, set up prejudice against one another. You know, cosmopolitanism is like we're kind of all in this world together. And, you know, all of these ideas, you know, rationalism, logic, empiricism, progressivism, cosmopolitanism, uh, all of these began to spread not just in England, but especially in the new world due to technologies like the printing press, right? You could read you could read about these ideas almost daily. And if you couldn't read, then somebody could potentially read to you. You had organizations that were purely dedicated to enlightenment principles, organizations like the Freemasons. This was a fraternity that promoted principles of enlightenment thought. One of its members, Benjamin Franklin, was what we call the embodiment of the Enlightenment in America. If there was one person who represented the Enlightenment and Enlightenment principles in the 13 colonies, it was Benjamin Franklin. He was the most popular guy in the colonies. You know, he, you know, he was the, you know, you might say the most interesting man in the world in the 1700s. This is a picture of him when he was very young. Just to give you an idea of all of his kind of, uh, you know, you know, all the criteria that sort of fit into this category. Benjamin Franklin was born into a Puritan family, left the Puritan church like many Puritans did, moved to Pennsylvania. He worked as a publisher where he produced the Pennsylvania Gazette, which was the most, most read newspaper in the colonies, right? Most read newspaper in the colonies. He believed in deism, which is that God 
exists, but plays no active role, right? So that the principles of science, right? The laws of science, that those could not be uh, interrupted by any sort of divine force. And a lot of enlightenment thinkers subscribe to this ideology that God exists, but he doesn't do anything in the physical world right here. He was interested in philanthropy, which means essentially to improve society. You might think of this like charity. Uh, he established, among other things, the University of Pennsylvania, which was the first secular college in the 13 colonies, not dedicated to any particular religious denomination like many of the colleges were at the time. And of course, his most famous scientific experiments, which involved the key and the kite experiment, which gave us a lot of the terms and ideas regarding electricity, that is electricity conducts to metal. So this also puts him in that category. And so for all these reasons here, you know, that's why we might refer to him as he is Mr. Enlightenment in America. So both of these ideas, the Great Awakening, which built a sense of community, and the Enlightenment, which spread all of these ideas really on how society should be organized and how governments ought to rule societies, uh, all of these things spread in the 50 years leading up to the American Revolution so that when events start picking up, you know, there are people in the colonies who are familiar with John Locke. There are people in the colonies who are familiar with all these principles, right? And these communities are in part built. At the very end of this section here, we have the establishment or the, the founding of the very last of the 13 colonies, and that is Georgia. And the story of Georgia is in part uh, tied to the Enlightenment. James Oglethorpe is the founder. Uh, there were primarily two motivations to establish Florida. One, or sorry, two motivations to establish Georgia. One was to provide a military barrier against Spanish Florida. Georgia would be the last or the most southern colony along the Atlantic coast, providing a barrier against Spanish Florida, which was an enemy, but also to create an enlightened utopia. And the idea behind Georgia was to create a colony for the worthy poor, those are the poor, those are people in England who are poor, not because it's their own fault, but due to circumstances. And so the idea was to relocate the worthy poor, create an enlightenment utopia where slavery and alcohol would be banned. Right? These were even though slavery was widely practiced and accepted throughout the colonies, it was still viewed by many as being immoral, alcohol consumption as as well. Uh, however, this utopia never really worked out in the long run. Slavery and alcohol would eventually be legal in Georgia. Most of the people who moved there would rather move to places like South Carolina, where all of those things were in fact legal.